Good evening, one and all present here. Department of English and Research Center, Triparashakti College for Women, Kuttalam, welcomes you all to the one week international webinar series on women, gender, literature, core concepts, and perspectives. Today is our day five, and we have an eminent resource persons with us. Before going to the session, I would like to give some few general instructions to the uh, participants. Uh, participants, once you enter the Zoom platform, can you mute your audio and video? So kindly cooperate with us to maintain the bandwidth and avoid the network issues. So please cooperate to uh, follow the or maintain the smooth flow of the webinar. Entry to the Zoom platform will be allowed for 500 participants. Beyond that, other participants can who cannot join the Zoom can view the session through the YouTube live stream. YouTube live stream link will be provided on the basis of request because we can adopt, accommodate uh, around 500 participants here itself. Attendance link, some feedback link for the day five will be posted only after the 8.15 p.m. today in the chat box. Please do not continuously ask for the attendance or feedback link in between the sessions. We request the participants not to post any kind of personal details like your email ID, phone number in the chat box. Please use the chat box only to record your observations, uh, give your feedbacks, and to pose your questions. With that note, we will begin today's session. Today, we have, a, we have an eminent resource person among us, and she is Dr. Stephen Our Events, Professor and Director, Institute of, for the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, Georgia State University, USA. So she's going to take uh, on or talk on the topic, Black women's life-giving literatures, mini arts, historical wellness, and the power of studying self. Um, uh, today, participants will enjoy her session, I hope so. And uh, I welcome Madam for this uh, wonderful, uh, uh, for giving her consent and being the part of our webinar. Uh, welcome, Madam. I wish to take over the session. Welcome, Madam. Excellent. Um, good morning here. Good evening there. Um, it is a pleasure. It is an honor to be here. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Karthika. Uh, I really appreciate this very special invitation. Um, this is um, part of my life work that I'll be presenting today. Um, and it really could not come at a better time because my work is about inner peace and the pursuit of inner peace amidst, um, amidst uh, you know, the, the stress that we're experiencing here in the United States and, and there you know, really globally. Um, so it's, it's really calming and an honor to be able to talk about this topic at this moment with so much going on and you know, the, the stress just reverberating um, around the nation. So um, this is a peaceful place for me to be able to talk about this work that has kept me centered um, despite all of the madness um, that's happening um, here and, and elsewhere. So my talk today is Black Women's Life-Giving Literature, Memoirs, Historical Wellness, and the Power of Studying Self. And I really focused on memoir uh, because of the theme of, the, of this webinar series in literature. And so I found myself attracted to life narratives um, in graduate school um, because uh, it's, a, it's an intersection between literature and history. And so um, today I'll cover my newest book project, uh, which is due out from State University Press of New York in March. 2021. Um, and it's really a context of the last um, of my life work in the past 25 years. But it's also a celebration of my 50th birthday, um, which I had just last year, and a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of institutionalized women's studies programs here in the United States. Um, and so 50 years ago, I was born at the same time that um, women's studies is, you know, women's studies was born. Um, so today the, the, the talk will be basically, you know, I like to 
to share with my students, you know, you have to have three points, the what, the so what, and the now what. So the what of my talk is about stress and power, and more specifically, stress, stress management. The so what is my theorizing of a concept that I call historical wellness, uh, which, is, which is to say, um, Black women have a history of wellness. They have a history of self-care. They have healing traditions. And um, it's incredibly important for me to focus on that as a tool for stress management. So we, you know, we tend to be in our, in our bodies, in our minds right here, right now. Um, but I'm trying to get us to focus on African-American women's history in particular as a site, not only of oppression, but of creative resistance and how, um, and how wellness is a form of historical resistance. And the now what is to add Africana yoga, right, to the language, to the history of yoga. So um, I, I'm going to share the, the, this, the journey that this work uh, has taken me on. And I really look forward to the discussion and the feedback. The, um, the, t the, The part of, you know, the, the, my entry point into yoga really was to look at wellness. And when we look at stress management, there are four or five um, major areas or major strategies that people use to manage stress. Meditation and yoga is one of them, music, prayer, and exercise. And this was a stress management report done by the American Psychological Association. So I use that to say, okay, if we're talking about stress, how do we understand um, how that, how, you know, how black women's history of stress management can add to this discussion? And I was talking, I was thinking about the concept of inner peace and um, I, and, and how we want to reposition the idea of power, right? Um, that power is usually defined externally in regards to how you can control others. But as I started doing the reading of African-American women's uh, memoirs and history, I really understood that peace um, is a site of power, that inner peace in particular is a site of resistance and in, in the United States, we have this hashtag, it's called Sight Black Women, and there's one uh, called Sight Assista. And it's, it's really an imperative to put at the center of the discussion, Black women. And so because I'm talking about yoga, I took a moment um, to uh, hashtag Sight Indian Women. So I looked up um, a very interesting paper by one of your students, uh, Dr. Kartika Mano Chitra, yeah, Annihilation of Apparatus, Exploring the Power Structure in Franz Kafka's In the Penal Colony. And so this is helping me understand, um, it was really an affirmation of my, um, of my uh, conceptualization of, of power, of internalized power. And in the paper, uh, uh, we, we find, quote, Initially, the old commandant who created the penal colony had power and control over the people in there. Later, when the explorer arrives, the power to approve or disapprove the apparatus created by the old commandant shifted to the explorer who came from a very long place. The explorer has the upper hand here. He has the power to change the lives of the people in the penal colony. This was really um, important for me, you know, in this moment when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, when we're talking about the political struggle in the United States of America, um, to really think about the apparatus of power and how it operates and how it is actually possible to shift. And, um, 
and so I, you know, I'm I'm building on work um, from uh, also um, Indian women, uh, Indian American women scholars or Desi scholars here, um, Rupa Singh, a professor at University of California Monterey Bay, talks about critical yoga studies. Rumia Pucha from the University of, of Georgia talks about Namaste Nation, and. Um, Srina Gandhi from Michigan State University talks about the cultural appropriation of yoga um, and whiteness in particular. And so as I'm forming these ideas um, to think about memoirs and life-giving literatures, um, it's, it's, uh, it's in a mindful, you know, kind of um, uh, understanding that my work is situated um, directly in relation to Indian women scholars. And so if we're talking about shifting this idea of peace and internal peace, um, I, I turn to the concept of intrapersonal intelligence. So we often talk about interpersonal, you know, interpersonal relationships and interpersonal um, um, power, like the relationships between people. But Howard Gardner in Frames of Mind in 1983 um, talks about the multiple intelligences. There's interpersonal, intrapersonal, logical, mathematical, naturalist, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, linguistic, and musical. And so these are all different ways that um, people have intelligence, or I, I, I say sites of power. So if I'm talking about internal power or internal intra uh, intelligence as a site of power, um, it's helpful to look at the theory of, of uh, multiple intelligences. Howard Gardner writes, at its most advanced level, intrapersonal intelligence, intrapersonal knowledge, allows one to detect and to symbolize complex and highly differentiated sets of feelings. One finds this form of intelligence developed in the novelist, like Proust, who can write introspectively about the feelings in the patient or the therapist who comes to attain a deep knowledge of his own feeling life. And this is the main part. In the wise elder who draws upon his or her own wealth of inner experiences in order to advise members of his community. And so this um, internal intrapersonal intelligence is really on display in black women elders and, uh, and elders writing in their life writing. So that's why I call this life giving writing. And um, this became very clear to me when I ran across a picture in my study of Rosa Parks doing yoga. Um, now, many of you may have already seen this, but for me, it was new. And it really was a turning point in my research in thinking about music, prayer, uh, exercise, but, but being able to focus on a history of Black American women doing yoga. And so this picture was taken in 1973. Rosa Parks was uh, 60 years old. And as you'll see, it's in the you know, uh, bottom of a church or a community center. And this was an important find for me because often we think of um, in, in, in America, it's thought of that, you know, um, uh, yoga is uh, in opposition to Christianity. But uh, Rosa Parks was a deaconess in the AME church and she was a practitioner of yoga as well. And so her, her um, nieces and nephews in a collection, I found textual evidence first before I found this picture. And they write about uh, they, her in these words, Auntie Rosa had interests that not too many people knew about. Her receptiveness always left me pleasantly surprised. This is especially true when she decided to join us at yoga classes. She really enjoyed it. Most people could never picture the mother of the civil rights movement do or doing upward facing dog or any of the other poses. But the older Auntie Rosa got, the more it seemed that she evolved. Well into her senior years, she has only recently begun practicing yoga. Splendid silver hair gives her away as the oldest student in most of the classes she occasionally attends with family, but she doesn't care. She reached a point when she considers herself a student of life. Her level of growth isn't tied to her age. 
She likes it that way. Eventually, she learns the movements and yogic principles well enough to practice alone in her home. She'll answer the door wearing yoga pants. That was a visual for me, Rosa Parks answering the door in yoga pants. Um, the exercisers help clear her mind. The stretches keep her body limber. In her space on the floor, she takes sanctuary, be it at a studio under the voice of an instructor or in the sunlight of her living room. Inner peace and clarity have always been important to her. Poses like Lotus Warrior, Upper Facing Dog weren't common where she came from. Now she knows them. She hasn't lived in India, but she respects its ancient traditions. She isn't Buddhist, uh, though she is definitely enlightened. She is my Auntie Rosa. And so this was um, a turning point for me to understand the history of African American women, um, you know, within this larger context of of those who do meditation like Anna Julia Cooper, who do music um, like uh, Marian Anderson, the opera singer, um, Dovey Roundtree, who was a lawyer, a civil rights lawyer, but also a minister, the uh, Delaney sisters who lived to be 104 and 109, who also practiced yoga, who I'll talk about later, and, um, and Ida Keeling, who began long distance running at the age of 67, and um, and so this is this is what I mean by um, the concept of historical wellness, um, and this was important to me personally because when we're talking about stress and stress management, I I uh, specifically talk about traumatic stress um, and survival of sexual violence and so and being a survival of sexual assault, and. Although it's not widely known, um, Rosa Parks did write about her struggles with the civil rights movement, but she also wrote about an attack that she personally experienced when she was working in a white person's home and, um, and she was attacked by a neighbor who uh, was a loud entry and who chased her around the house. And, 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 but she was also an anti-rape activist um, as was um, uh, raised by the recent Me Too movement. So all of these kind of um, stress and stress management, the public and the private really hit home for me because I am a survivor of violence as well. And so when I um, started studying stress management and healing in particular, and um, began my own trying to understand my own relationship to yoga and my own med meditation practice, it was really helpful to, um, to go back to these historical narratives. And, and that's, the, that's the so what, that these historical narratives actually exist, that um, historical wellness is, is something that um, really has not been a focus um, in particular of African-American history. Um, John Hope Franklin, who is one of the premier um, historians here uh, for African-American history, chronicles how history has been recorded. And um, that there is the presence, there's oppression, and there's creative resistance. And so I'm, I'm focusing on the creative resistance with a full understanding that you can't understand healing without understanding traumatic stress and the history of violence. And so I, I theorized this concept called historical wellness. And I'll read from you um, from chapter nine um, of the, the forthcoming book. And it's called The Purpose of Black Women's Studies, Meditation on a 50th Anniversary. Um, Barbara Smith, who is one of the founding members of Black Women's Studies um, here in the United States and uh, co-editor of a book titled, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave, writes that the purpose of Black Women's Studies is to save Black women's lives. And so um, this concept of historical wellness is a life-giving and life-saving theory. And I write, when we consider historical portraits of black women, a complex and diverse interdisciplinary picture of wellness emerges. Though I came to this idea independently, historical wellness is the culmination of decades of studying black women's memoirs 
and the term as a distinct beneficiary of existing scholarship by Black women scholars. The work of Black women scholars, particularly exemplary books like Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the Origins of American Gynecology by Deidre Cooper Owens, demonstrate the vibrancy of Black women's health history and health history's centrality to Africana women's wellness. In Medical Bondage, Owen writes about how women's medical practice in the United States developed literally on the bodies of enslaved Black women. Owens develops language to discuss the horrific treatment of African women on U.S. plantations and the dehumanizing situation of Black bodies in the name of profit and science. She unveils the process of developing new language in order to encompass the complexity of the historical situation. And she also addresses the need to interpret the evolution of gynecology more adequately. Dr. Owens writes, since coining and defining the term medical superbody, I have wrestled with its use because it is a fraught denominator. Other than the problematic descriptor degraded, which was broadly used to label disempowered women, no historic label from the antebellum or pre-Civil War era encaps encapsulates the complexities and contradictions that were part and parcel of enslaved women's socio-medical experiences. Qu consequently, my use of medical superbody is intentionally messy, ambiguous, and contentious because Black women's entrance into gynecology proved complex. And I write, like Owens, my definition of historical wellness came from my awareness of the inaccuracy and scarcity of existing terms to define the historical phenomenon of healing traditions I observed in Black women's narratives. At at the same time, the term, the term historical wellness is messy, fraught, ambiguous, and contentious, precisely because it's dependent on an understanding of historical violence. And so my concept of historical wellness embraces being messy. And I think this is an especially important when, um, when looking at a history of something like yoga which is, is, um, is such a complex history, such a complex Indian tradition. And so I, I use the concept of historical wellness, understanding that there are some limitations in the process, but I do so um, you know, in a way that forces me to be brave in looking at the different ways that African-American women have related to their body that is in some ways reflective of the Indian yoga tradition, but in other ways organically developed. And so in this study, I focus on um, six narratives by African-American women who, who were all practitioners of yoga, some in the traditional Indian tradition and some in the understanding of what um, BKS Iyengar um, writes about holistic health and the, the concept and, you know, in the tradition of um, Vivekananda and the tradition of Putanjali. Um, and and my, my understanding that my, um, my um, knowledge of Indian yoga is very limited. I'm I've just been studying um, very recently, um, and I, I have been studying Kemetic yoga, uh, which is an African-based system. Um, and so I, I'm still learning about the yoga process, but, learn, but learning through the historical practices of Black women has brought me closer to the practice. So for example, if we are to understand yoga, as a unity of the mind, body, and spirit, as a connection of one's inner self or the subtle body, and that connection to the inner light 
um, of the universe and the, the connection of, of others, then there are, there's historical evidence of African-American women doing that mind, body, and spirit practice. One being Harriet Jacobs, who was born enslaved um, in 1813. And she escaped um, um, into her grandmother's attic for seven years. And it was due to the sexual harassment of the plantation owner. And she was trying to avoid his advances. She did have two children um, by another man um, of, her, of her choosing, uh, so much as those who are enslaved can choose. Um, but when the, when the master of the plantation threatened to sell her children into slavery, she ran away and, um, and her uncle built a, a small hiding place in the attic of her grandmother's house where she stayed for seven years. Um, while she was contemplating her escape, she talked about meditation. And she wrote again and again, I had traversed those dreary 12 miles to and from the town and all the way I was meditating upon some means of escape for myself and my children. My friends had made every effort um, that ingenuity could devise to effect their purchase, but all their plans had proved abortive. Dr. Flint, who was the plantation owner, was, was suspicious and determined not to loosen his grip on us. And then she talks about peace. And if we're talking about inner peace, um, she was meditating on freedom and she was internalizing this concept of peace. And she wrote, um, Miss Fanny, who was a woman who had freed her grandmother, condoled me, right? Offered condolences with me in her own particular way. She said, I wished that my, she said, uh, she wished that I and all my grandmother's family were at rest in their graves for not until then should she feel peace about us. And then Harriet Jacobs writes about her concept of peace. She said that good old soul did not dream. I was planning to bestow peace upon her with regard to myself and my children, not by death, but by securing our freedom. So it was a different concept of, you know, some people think, well, we'll have peace in the afterlife and, you know, oh, you're a slave and you'll never be free. So we, we hope, you know, that you'll have peace. Um, uh, but, but as early, you know, in the, in the mid 1800s, um, uh, in 1848, when, uh, when Harriet Jacobs escaped, when she published her book in 1861, it was before Vivekananda came in 1893. And so what I'm, what I'm arguing with, with um, Africana yoga is that black women had practices in holistic health and wellness and healing in relation to their body um, before the tradition of Indian yoga hit American shores. Um, but what I'm also saying is that African-American women were direct beneficiaries of the Indian tradition of yoga. And we see that in Sadie and Bessie Delaney who were born in North Carolina and um, who lived to be 109 and 104. And you'll see them here in their exercise practice. And that was partially because of, of yoga. Um, in the 1960s, yoga, was in 1960s, 1970s, yoga began to be televised in the United States. And so when the Delaney sisters were um, turning 60 years old and turning, seven, turning 70 years old, their mother was turning 80 and she began to hunch over. So they started watching these television shows of, of um, you know, Indian yoga and they started their, what they called exercise, which was yoga practice. So um, they wrote, you know, they wrote um, in the mornings, Monday through Friday, we do our exercises. 
I start doing I started doing yoga exercises with mama about 40 years ago. Mama, mama started to shrink up and get bent down. And I started exercising with her to straighten her up again. Only I didn't know at the time it was yoga exercises. Uh, we just thought we were doing, um, even after mama died. Well, when Bessie, who was the younger sister, so Sadie, the older sister, who was, you know, they called sweet Sadie and Bessie was Queen Bess. They had two completely different personalities. But when the older sister started doing yoga, um, it's when Bessie turned 80, she decided I looked better than her. So she decided she wanted to do yoga too. Uh, so we've been doing our exercises together ever since. We follow the exercise yoga, yoga program on TV. Um, sometimes Bessie cheats. I'll be doing exercises and look over her and she'll just be laying there. She's a naughty old gal. Um, so these are just some of the narratives that I'm uncovering about the, the history of, of yogic traditions um, that are Indian based, but that are also um, organic and African based that I think will help um, uh, create some inroads in the discussions that go beyond Black, that go beyond um, the white cultural appropriation of yoga um, to offer us a gray area of, of the relationships that um, black and brown women are already um, having and, and establishing um, here. And as yoga grows nationally, and um, there was a, just a recent movie um, called um, um, Township Yogi about yoga in South Africa. So yoga is, is here to stay. It's um, uh, fortunately, it's I found um, personally beneficial um, with meditation and um, clearing my mind um, as we, um, you know, as I've struggled to survive work stress and stress here in the United States, just being black uh, being a woman, being a survivor of sexual violence. Um, and this study has really given me um, quite a bit of, of energy. Um, but I'm, I'm just at the beginning of the study and really looking forward to the dialogue. Um, so I'm noticing the time uh, that's about half an hour. Uh, I'd like to play the video of um, the book and then we can enter into um, discussion and the, this, uh, this, it's eight minutes and it covers every chapter of the book so that you can see some of the, you know, the, the concepts that I've raised, some of the narratives that I've shared, but also looking at post uh, 1970, 1975. And um, Anna Julia Cooper, who's one of the first images that you'll see uh, was born enslaved in Raleigh, North Carolina in, in, um, in 1858, and she lived to be 105 and a half. Um, she had a sunroom. And so I'm looking, you know, when we talk about the idea of sun salutation, I'm trying to take us back to um, the, the, the idea that, the, that Africans had a relationship to the sun in Africa with uh, Queen Makita in Ethiopia, but that African-American women um, through things like having a sunroom on your porch. When I talked to the great nephew, the great nephew of Anna Julia Cooper, he said that she would go out on, you know, on the sun porch every morning and she wrote there every morning. So writing is a meditation. Um, and so the, the power of studying self um, for me has again, uh, to go back to the beginning, um, an internalized sense of power that has given me with the focus on my ancestors and my elders, some hope in the midst of this global pandemic, um, in the midst when uh, of, of, of racial violence, um, anti-Black violence um, that has been since slavery on these shores. Um, and the, the idea of the, the importance of, of breathing um, when we, you know, when uh, there's police violence and we hear the I can't breathe in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, that this work has allowed me some inroads to manage the stress um, of this work um, while being, you know, a professor, a department chair, 
um, and, uh, you know, and a black woman all at the same time. So I'm going to stop there and play this video. And then I really look forward to the, to the discussion. Can you see the video? Yes, ma'am, you can play it. Okay, thank you. To be sad, me trying to hide me. I'm saying goodbye, your friend. The way we're growing, still friends. And now I've decided 
So that is a, oh, that is a um, kind of general look at the book and uh, how I'm defining, um, redefining, seeking to redefine power um, internally. So I uh, definitely look forward to the discussion and um, I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, shall we take some questions, ma'am? Yes, please. Uh, a question from Dr. John Paul. Is yoga the painkiller to escape? Uh, am I audible? Shall I proceed? Yes. Is yoga the painkiller to escape from intellectual oppression or does yoga help to be away from disgusting reality? Or is yoga more a weapon like Ahimsa as Gandhiji used in India against Britishers? 
Oh, okay. So I see this question from you can see John, oh. John Paul. Yes. 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 Okay. Good. Good. Is yoga the painkiller to escape from intellectual oppression? Oh, or does yoga help to be away from? This is a wonderful question. I um, I don't know. I am very mindful of the need um, not to escape what's going on right now in the streets. Um, there is very important activism that's happening. And I sometimes feel um, guilty for, you know, what I feel is hiding away, reading and writing, um, the concept of doing, um, you know, being on, being on a mat um, can be a form of escape. And, and I think Angela Davis, who is, um, a longtime activist talks about the limits of self-care. And if we focus on something like yoga, as it has been commodified and commercialized, absolutely, it's a form of escape. On the other hand, um, in, in the protests, you know, a few weeks ago, um, a few months ago, um, there's been yoga practices that have brought people together as part of community activism that's not at all um, escaping reality. And um, for example, there was um, a, a Black Lives Matter protest um, in Washington, D.C., um, you know, in the middle of the night where there was a curfew and in, in, in breaking curfew, they held a yoga class. Um, it, at the border, at the Mexican United States border, um, there were, you know, when this administration began putting children in cages, um, there were Mexican yoga practitioners who stood outside of the, of the, um, of the essentially camps, right, where the children were being held and to give them um, some connection and some power uh, along the Mexican border, Mexican yogi practitioners, you know, they, so I think yoga can be an escape. It can be um, commercialized. Um, um, or is yoga a modern weapon um, like Ahimsa? Yes, um, as, as Gandhiji used in India, it, it can be either or. And so, I think what's interesting, and I, I'm so, you know, I come in the, I come into this work with fear and trembling, uh, because I know so little about yoga. But what I have seen is that, you know, I saw an interview with BKS Iyengar, and he talked about realizing he was black when he went to England and United States and couldn't get in the hotels. He's like, oh wait a minute, and he talked about using yoga. Uh, mindfully as a weapon against white supremacy. And so I, I don't think anything is inherently good or bad. Um, yoga is no exception. Um, and I understand that there are so many um, contentious conversations that are happening within the Indian community, within the South Asian community. Um, when I started this work, I was saying Southeast Asian. And someone had to correct me like geographically and say, you know, okay, there's there's so much going on if you look at the, the color um, challenges um, within, you know, colorism within, um, within India, right? There are colorism conversations that we have here as well. So um, yoga is not a panacea. Yoga, it doesn't cure everything. Yoga is not magical any more than uh, prayer is or any more than um, music is or dance. Um, um, and I think I came to yoga because I used to be a dancer. So I've always had this relationship with my body. Um, but I don't think it's inherently one thing or another. It can be the, the, the principles, um, the limited you know, amount that I do know about the principles of yoga. It can be consciousness raising. It can be uh, mind expanding. It can be um, the, the ethical principles that we practice with each other. 
it can be compassion. It can be all those things. It's not inherently so. Does that address the question? Yes, yes, yes. I think so. Perfect. Uh, shall we move on to the next question? Uh, how does yoga go against Christianity? Um, that's that's here, especially in the you know in the United States, in the African American community, um, it's seen as um, it's seen as anti-Christian, and and actually there's a dissertation um, that I want to um, highlight um, translating, practicing, and commodifying yoga in the United States by Srina Gandhi, um, talks about the initial, like in the 1960s um, and even in the early 1900s, when yoga was presented in the United States, um, it was seen as evil um, because there were white women who were, you know, leaving their husbands to go, you know, and all of these things. But um, in the black community, it was seen as, you know, oh, that, that, the devil stuff that you're doing. Um, when I ran across the picture of, of Rosa Parks doing yoga, that was a pretty strong um, argument against, you know, that the idea that some people got it. You can be Christian and do yoga. Um, there were, you know, and, and so there's, again, so many conversations that are being had about religion inter-religion relationships, but there's also, you know, lots of conversations I know happening within the Indian community or Indian communities about yoga and, and its relationship to Hindu. Is it, you know, Buddhist? Is it all of these things? So um, the, the question of Christianity and, and yoga is, is complicated, but it's as complicated as the idea of religion or spirituality within the Indian community. So there's there's no one right answer, but um, the fact that yoga that Rosa Parks, who was a deaconess in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, a respected elder, and she was practicing in Detroit, was not only practicing yoga but teaching it. That blew my mind. I was like, wait a minute, what? She, and so uh, I've given this presentation quite a bit um, and African-American uh, women and men come up to me and go this, you know, my family thinks I'm crazy. They tell me I'm, you know, devil worshiping, you know, all of this stuff. But I just say, you know, look at Rosa Parks. She, she was um, a deep Christian um, and, and, and saw no conflict in that discussion. Yes, um, next question. Can you comment on the black women mental health? Oh, yes. Lord, yes, I can. <laughs> um, as I said, so um, my focus for my work is intellectual history. And I didn't really know that I was focusing specifically and, on- And there's again a continuity of the question, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, can okay. you comment on the black women mental health? And was it different from other women's mental health? She's asking to mention that also. Was oh, good. It different from other women's mental health. Yes, yes, absolutely. So far, it's different. Uh, so, so black women's mental health, the struggle for mental health, has been fundamentally different here in the United States because of of history. You cannot escape the history of enslavement. Um, there's been a recent project um, called the 1619 Project, which um, um, has become a lightning rod because. Um, you know, even though Africans came to this country or this continent um, um, before what we know of as enslavement, um, 1619 is often um, given as a, um, a, 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 an important historical time marker. Um, and so if we are systematically, institutionally raped and our children are are stolen from us and uh, our, our brothers and our fathers and our, our husbands, if we're fortunate to have them, 
are murdered and raped, you know, murdered. Um, and there were also those as well. So the, the mental health struggle for African-American women has, is fundamentally different. Um, that being said, there is, you know, this idea of humanity. So um, the poet Mari Evans has a wonderful poem in which she says, you know, the first thing you do is forget I'm, I'm black, right? Don't just look at me as my race, um, as my gender. You know, the first thing you do is forget I'm a black woman. The, the second thing you do is never forget I'm a black woman. So we at once have to understand that black women's struggles are particular because of our, you know, in, in African America, but really in the diaspora. Um, but our struggles are human struggles. And so um, poet, the poet Sonia Sanchez says, you know, peace is a human right. So our mental health challenges are really tied to the history of enslavement, the history of torture in this country, um, which obviously we're still experiencing, um, you know, because I, I, I fear for my life. I've never felt safe. And so that is different than, um, you know, some experiences of some of my colleagues. Um, but I don't see myself as anything other than human. And so if we're looking at, um, let's say for the Black Lives Matter platform, for example, there are 13 main points that all are in line with the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human, of human Rights. So while this work is particular to the United States, um, the World Health Organization also talks about violence against women around the world. So, uh, so traumatic violence tied to um, sex trafficking, tied to, you know, so what we're experiencing is at once particular, but it's also universal. Yes. Another question. Is there any difference on the theme of ancient Black women's literature and modern Black women's literature? Yes. Um, I start with, um, I, you know, I, I, I hesitate because it's so easy to romanticize Africa. Africa is a continent, you know, and, and so um, there were, you know, ancient African women in um, Egypt, yes, um, but in uh, what we know of now as South Africa, in West Africa, in East Africa, um, with Makeda and Ethiopia um, being a prime example. Um, and so I think it's, it's a mistake to oversimplify and romanticize um, ancient African women who were all queens, right? Um, I think it's, it's very important to see how modern Black women um, make connections. Uh, and so one of the reasons why I use the um, the example of Queen Makita is because it, um, she did not herself write, but she was written about in the Bible, in the Quran, um, in the Talmud, and in um, the Kibra Negas, which is the you know the Ethiopian um, uh, kind of historical uh, lineage, right? Um, so when people say, you know, who do you think you are, the Queen of Sheba? Um, there is this, there's this allure of, of what she represented as a queen. But if you look closely at the quote, it says, Queen Makita and her people saluted the sun, the rising and the setting sun. So there is the, the reality of the different types of African women, not all of whom are written about, not all of whom are royalty, but there's also how Black women um, and Black American women in particular um, relate to that history. And so you have people like Maya Angelou writing about the Queen of Sheba. You have Rose Butler Brown 
who was the first um, African-American woman to earn a PhD in education at Harvard, making reference to the Queen of Sheba. Um, so um, it's, it's important to understand, you know, and I know that, you know, Beyonce has just come out with um, Black is King, and there's a lot of very rich dialogue about how African-Americans relate to Africans uh, or um, uh, represent Africans, present Africans. Um, you know, not not to mention that you know the the Atlantic world or those Africans who are out, outside of you know kind of the general area that we that we commonly discuss in popular culture. Um, so there's um, there's yeah that that's what I would say that that Afri African American women write um, in an, in a way that we understand. Like I'm I'm African, you know. I have I wear my cowrie shells because I, I, you know, my, my history was stolen from me. Um, and so part of that is being reclaimed now. Um, and it's not to oversimplify it, but it's to really understand that, that African-American women write with, um, you know, and certainly those like, let's say Harriet Tubman, when, uh, you know, understood her, herself as an African. So there's, um, um, Mary McLeod Bethune, who, because they were just a generation or two away from, um, you know, those who were, those who were enslaved, like there's, there's a, at once a continuum and, and kind of this need to repair those, those areas that weren't, um, that weren't clear that are in African, African American women's writing. And, 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 when, and I'm sorry, and when I say writing, I'm, I'm specifically talking about life writing. Um, yeah, the, uh, literature, and that's a whole other story. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, what's the next question? Um, uh, did you get opposition from the church? Was it termed as black magic? Um, not me personally. Uh, my spiritual journey has been, um, has been really interesting because um, I was raised in the Church of Christ. Uh, my mother's side of the family is Catholic. Um, and um, I've been on this really interesting spiritual journey. Um, I moved I moved out of the house. I was an emancipated youth. So I moved out of the house and I've been on my own at 16. And so um, while I wasn't raised um, in one place in the church, um, I feel very connected to, um, to my Christian roots, um, but I also don't see that in opposition with understanding um, um, the, you know, my spirit, my spiritual self-definition and my relationship to uh, something, you know, like yoga. Um, but like I said, you know, many people have come up to me and said that their family members don't, you know, but, but I think that's slowly changing. I think it's slowly changing um, in that when we, when we look back into the 19, you know, so Yoga Journal was founded in 1975 and that picture of Rosa Parks was in 1973. Um, there was really an explosion in the 1960s and 70s that normalized it. And there were a lot of um, community-based. So, you know, that slide that I showed, um, you know, looking in the archives, there were references um, at Howard University, um, the Howard University Hilltop was the, the newspaper there on campus. They had several references to yoga, um, yoga in class, yoga and um, African dance classes. Um, and so there's definitely some opposition in the church, but if you look in the archives historically, there's a lot of evidence like Rosa Parks wasn't doing yoga in 1973 out of nowhere. There was a whole collective of black people who were understanding and the, another that clip also showed um, there was a 1960 um, a 1960 spread um, in Ebony magazine. And it was the story of someone who had traveled to India um, and learned yoga. And then in the comments, um, the, what we now is, we have a chat box now, but in the comments section of the um, Ebony Magazine, someone wrote in from West Virginia and said, 
I, uh, I appreciate this story, but yoga is not solely a religious practice. Um, it is a holistic health practice that Black people would do good. I've been practicing yoga for 40 years. So in 1960, there was a, man, a Black man in West Virginia who was, who was you know, so yes, um, when we say the church, there's certainly um, Christian opposition to it. Um, but if you look historically in the archives, there's ample evidence that Black people really understand yoga is about the relationship of the body um, and the relationship to the body and the spirit that transcends um, our, you know, kind of mandate or conceptualizations of, of um, religion. Well, next question, OT. Thank Being you so opposed, much. These questions are wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Um, being a person who survived sexual violence and work stress, where you believe yoga has played a critical role, don't you think there is a need for spreading the message of yoga and how it leads wellness among the masses of America? Yes, that's why I'm here. Um, I'm so I'm grateful to be doing this work because you know you never know how work is going to be received. And like I said, I don't I don't perceive um, India as like one thing. There's a range of perspectives. There's a range of um, political ideologies. There's a range of cultural. You know that goes back to the origins of yoga. So I I don't presume that there is one yoga and that everybody feels the same way about it or that everybody will even accept that I'm talking about it in a particular way, right? Um, that being said, you know, the power of studying the self means that I understand I would not be here without yoga. I understand I would not be here without a healthy relationship to my body. Because I was attacked several times, um, you know, you know, and I, I just, I felt worthless. By the time I was 16, I was, I had suicidal ideations. I was not going to be present. Um, and so it was my eighth grade dance teacher who helped me have a healthy relationship with my body. And so in the stretches that we did, I found the seeds of yoga. So by the time I was in graduate school, um, and I took a for my first formal yoga class, I was like, oh, this is what I've been doing with my body. And, um, and I must say, um, Jaina Long, who is um, the, the founder of Black Yoga, the Black Yoga Teachers Alliance, um, had a very similar experience. She writes, um, she wrote the foreword to the book and she writes, yoga was doing me before I was doing yoga. And so I absolutely think that there is a need to, um, to broaden the, the practice of yoga, the study of yoga, um, especially now when there is um, violence. But I, I, I agree very much with um, Angela Davis. And I think this goes to the origin of the first question that yoga can't be uh, a way to escape. Yoga, you know, a yoga can't, shouldn't be a way to um, just make money to capitalize, to sell products, to gain celebrity, to do all of those things. And there are very questionable ways that people have used yoga, um, you know, in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. Um, that's just, uh, but I think that what it, what it has done for me, what a daily practice of breathing just breathing and meditation. What I the effect that I that I know it has on my students, you know, I I just do kind of an informal meditation before or after. I play music at the beginning of my class, and usually, you know, two minutes before class, um, you know, especially teaching online, like the world is a mess right now. It's a hot, crazy dumpster fire, um, and so like who doesn't need to breathe? Um, I was just I taught my first class online, um, and everybody stressed out. So, you know, we had two minutes to, to class and I'm, I'm mindful of people's time. So I said, we've got two minutes left. There were no more questions. So I just said, oh, okay, so let's breathe and do a breathing practice. And to some, that may be the only yoga that they ever do. 
or they ever want to do. And they might not even consider it yoga. But I do think that there is room um, in this, in definitely this nation, in this entire world for people to connect, you know, to greet the sun, the rising and setting sun and realize that even though there are people who are dictators, who think they make the world go round, you know, that last quote is from a song by India Ari, one of my favorite music artists, you know, India Ari of all things, right? Um, who, who writes, I, you know, as for me, I'm gonna follow the sun. And so this, you know, if we can connect to that light in ourselves and connect that light to the sun and, and to each other, then we'll have a little bit of perspective. And um, like Mari Evans says, clarity, like Rosa Parks says, clarity. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you will be effective um, in fighting those people who think that they make the world go round. Oh. Can you comment on kinetic yoga? Yes, um, kinetic yoga, as I practice, um, uh, my uh, definitely a, a shout out to my um, teacher, um, Yersir Ra Hotep. Um, and if you go to um, kinetic skills, uh, is it kinetic? Is it kinetic skills? Uh, if you Google kinetic yoga and and Hotep, Yersir Ra Hotep. He um, is from Chicago, and in the 1970s, as a Black man in Chicago, he started um, practicing yoga with um, Dr. Happy um, Asir, and so that was his yoga teacher, and, and uh, Yersir Ra uh, uh, Hotep um, um, developed this practice of going to Egypt and looking at um, the ancient temples, right? But it was not just the temples, it was the, the practices, the, the texts, um, where we see Africans practicing like the, 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 what we call the plow pose, that image is from uh, a temple of Geb, the, the Egyptian dancer um, is what we call the wheel pose, right? So there's ev the, the lotus pose, um, all of those images um, were were images that that um, comedic yoga founders pulled together, and there's certainly others who have developed um, similar practices. But this idea that um, you know, and again, I'm trying to make an intervention, but a respectful intervention. You can't erase India from yoga. That's just that's uh, you, you can't have yoga without India. But neither can you have the narratives that we see where it's Indian yoga and then yoga goes to Europe and then yoga comes to America and Africa is nowhere in the picture, right? That um, if we're talking about ancient civilizations, if we're talking about first dynasty, second dynasty and practices and, and how um, ancient civilizations um, saw themselves in relation to the sun as uh, Ra, sun worshipers, Shu, the god of breath, um, all of those comedic principles, um, and even in, let's say, West Africa, um, um, much later, right, um, um, relatively modern West, West Africa, and Adinkra symbols, there is a whole system of thought that um, chronicles that, that relates symbols to um, to concepts of, of home, and love and justice. And so the understanding the African role in yoga is not to displace Indian yoga. It is to um, place beside that the African narrative and Kemetic, um, Kemet was the, was the name for, um, for what we call Egypt. And um, there are people like Yasser Rahotep, like um, Greg Carr, um, uh, and the, there's an organization for um, cla classical African civilizations um, of professionals who study um, and, you know, they're often dismissed as, oh, that's those the hoteps, you know, they call them, but hotep means peace. And so if we're saying, you know, namaste, which I know means more than, than simply peace or the light in me and the light in you and how it's often portrayed as, as I've been told very offensive 
um, um, by some of my colleagues, um, we can't ignore that there is a history of African people who, who are healers and who have relationships to our body and our mind and who have entire thought systems about how to be human in this world um, and to be a healer in this world. So, um, so that's my, that's my um, relationship to comedic yoga. Um, and, um, you know, as I said, this is, you know, the, the funny thing is, you know, I've written this book and I feel like I'm just now beginning to understand the fullness of what it means. And it will probably take me another two or three decades um, in doing this work to really learn what yoga means. Um, you know, I don't know all of the Sanskrit names for the poses or concepts. Um, so again, I come, I come to this work being very humble, um, but I also know that I have an organic relationship with my body um, and that that relationship is a mirror of, of Africans um, who were practicing healing, um, healing modalities um, in the same way that Indians were. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll take the next one. Can inculcating the sense of inner peace bring a change or difference in the providing injustice, injustice in the society? Because it is impossible to create such an awakening in consciousness at every individual level, provided to the way array of people in society. Um, yes, yes, uh, I do think that, you know, I know that the, the Dalai Lama has a, uh, I think three books on meditation and talks about the impact that inner peace has on outer peace. And that's reflected in black women's writing as well. Um, one, of the, one of the women um, featured is um, a professor of religion, Jan Willis. Um, she's a professor of religion at Agnes Scott College here in Atlanta, Georgia. And she was um, part of the you know, black power struggle um, at Cornell University um, in the 1960s. And she, she has a chapter in her book and her book, by the way, is called Black Baptist and Buddhist. So again, that question of, you know, is yoga um, separate from Christianity? I mean, she, she embodies that. She says she is black. She retains her you know, origins as a Baptist, but she's also Buddhist. Um, so she talks specifically about the inner change and the impact that it can have on the outer, the outer struggle. Um, and this is also addressed explicitly in, um, so there's two books, um, I call this a feminist womanist framework. Um, the feminist framework comes from Audre Lorde and who talks about, you know, um, self-care being compassion, like self-compassion. And she says, black women have always been taught to have compassion for everybody else but ourselves. So, um, you know, but that, that self-care is also political for black women. And that is that yoga is self-possession. It's very political for a black person, a black woman in particular to say, I own myself. Um, and so just the act of inner peace for black women has definitely brought about change. Um, um, Laili Maparian is the womanist scholar that I, that I cite um, her, her book, The Womanist Idea. And she specifically says that there's a relationship of inner peace to outer peace. And you know, the book, it's, it's too long. The book is like 400 and some pages, but it's, it's just chock full with um, black women who give us all different sides and dimensions of what inner peace looks like. And many of them, like Rosa Parks, um, embody the idea that it's possible to fight for justice and also not do so in a way that requires your own demise. That she lived to be 92. She wouldn't live to be 92 if she didn't do yoga. You know, she was stressed out 
people were calling her house. She had to leave. Um, she had to leave uh, Alabama because of death threats because she sat on a bus because she didn't want to sit at the back of the bus because she was an activist, a peace activist. She talked about peace and harmony. And so she's a great example, as are these other women. That's why I study centenarians like Anna Julia Cooper. I don't know, you know, I just made 50. I don't know if I'm going to make 100. You know, certainly in these days, you know, I feel like James Baldwin here. I'm like, in these days, <laughs> it seems to me, I don't know if I'll see tomorrow. Um, but either way, if I live to be, you know, 52 or if I live to be 105, I have to believe that what I do can contribute to this human project in a way that feeds other people um, the same way that I've been filled by um, reading Black women's memoirs. They have, you know, Anna Julia Cooper um, was writing in the 1890s and her, her writing, her meditative writings filled my spirit. I feel like there is a way, you know, um, and it's not about living forever. It's about living, it's about living. Oh, I'll take the next one. Is yoga, yoga a way of escape of re or realizing the self and its connection to the God? Do you agree with the view that women can realize the mystery of life better than men as they suffer more than men? <laughs> oh, I love this question. Um, so, so first, there, there is definitely a difference in suffering, right? In the, let's say I'm a black woman and, and have I suffered, you know, um, more than some of my white counterparts, um, un undoubtedly. Is it inherent that women or black people suffer more than um, men or white people? Um, um, no, this is all this is all human made, right? Um, all the suffering is suffering that we create. So I don't think that being a survivor of sexual violence makes me special. Like I've experienced something that nobody else has experienced because people are suffering all over the world. I'm sitting in relative comfort right now. There are people who are suffering much more than I am right now. Um, but it's not about, uh, it's not um, a zero sum game. Like either you're suffering or I'm suffering. My suffering is worse than your suffering. Um, therefore I'm better. Um, and, and, and there's the, you know, the idea that it's a dichotomy, man or woman. Um, what about transgender people, right? What about intersex people? Um, so it's not as simple as pulling apart, you know, white, black. What about, you know, mixed race people? Uh, what about people who are um, not even black or white or Indian, right? Or Asian, right? What about Native American people? How do we measure Native American suffering in this country? How do we measure indigenous suffering around the world, right? Those in New Zealand and Australia, Aboriginals in Australia, like, you know, like indigenous people. Um, so it's not about who suffers more. It's about the project of us being collectively responsible for creating um, a world that suffers less. And, um, and Wangari Mathai, um, a Kenyan woman activist, talked about the quality of life. You know, she she was a she planted trees, um, and she was she was an incredible activist because she you know the trees were a metaphor. She planted trees that she would never see bloom. Right. Um, so our task is to not focus on who suffers more. Um, but to really pay attention to those people who can help us understand what it means to suffer less. And in this perspective, you know, it, it's the history of black women who have been put through enslavement, been put through separation, segregation, oppression, um, sexual violence and all these different ways, who as Anna Julia Cooper wrote, you know, we're at this very particular 
intersection of oppressions, um, what Kimberly Crenshaw calls intersectionality and in our um, relationship to power, um, what Anna Julia Cooper was talking about that in 1892 and, and, and many other women before, before her. Um, so it's not who suffers more, it is how can we collectively be responsible for us suffering less? Yes. Um, uh, well, next question. What are the other elements or practices like yoga that help African-American women escape from American supremacy? Other elements or practices? Um, other elements, I think that's a very important question because when, when I say yoga, most people are thinking hatha yoga, right? They're thinking the yoga postures and that's really what's presented, the, the yoga on the mat. And it's really sometimes very athletic and you know all of that. Um, but the Raj, as I understand it, the, the traditional, um, the, the meditation, the, the mindfulness, the pranayama, the breathing, um, I, I came to study, um, yeah, I made the jump from intellectual history to mental health. And I realized when, you know, when we say I can't breathe, um, we're, you know, and we talk about the public oppression, I realized that my mode of managing stress was to hold my breath. I, um, and that's how I, de I developed an ulcer. Uh, my first year in college, I, um, I was so stressed out about everything that I just didn't know if I was going to make it. I was so happy to be in college, but I didn't, you know, I was working full time. I was paying for an expensive school. I didn't know if I would make it. And so I, I developed an ulcer and I had these just, you're just holding everything in. So African-American women write about meditation and breathing in ways that helped me understand that that was where I held my stress. And so um, when we say mind, body, and spirit as holistic health, when we talk about yoga, it can't simply be we bend over and touch our toes and this is physical hatha yoga. It has to be a true understanding of the spirituality of yoga however that is defined, and um, the mental, emotional, and definitely the intellectual, you know, because my, uh, the only reason I'm here is because I, you know, I've learned how to breathe and not holding my breath um, in a way that negatively impacts every system of my body. So um, yeah, African, African American women have certainly written about the, the important role of mindfulness, um, uh, Mindfulness-based stress reduction, right, is one of the, um, or cognitive-based um, compassion training. Those are both um, mindfulness trainings that are here in the United States that are not based on the physical movements of yoga, but are based on the, you know, compassion and the breathing and the relaxed mental state being here, being present, being now. Um, some of the interventions that Black women help us make into understanding yoga is even the concept. So, um, so both those, you know, MBSR and CBCT, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and um, compassion-based, a, a cognitive-based compassion training. I think I'm getting those mixed up. Um, they both, you know, focus on the here and the now and the present without judgment. Um, the inter one of the interventions that reading African-American women as yoga practitioners help us to understand is the concept of time. So um, for example, in comedic yoga, one of the, one of the ways that um, your sir articulates comedic yoga differs from Indian yoga is this concept of being connected to the ancestors. So comedic yoga is relational to ancestors and black women's writing um, talks about looking back, you know, Anna Julia Cooper, and that's the framework for the book, looking back for wisdom, looking in for strength 
and looking forward with hope and faith. So wellness activism is about um, how black women allow us to reconceptualize time and that yes, we have to be here, we have to be now, but black women's experiences show us the, the value and the need to be connected to other people across time. Yes, ma'am. And I, I know there's one. another seminar right after, is that correct? Yes, yes. We will take this final one and we will wind up. There are so many questions. Has commodification or commercialization of African yoga helped in exploration or preservation of Black identity, even now when Indic yoga has large consumer base? Yes. Yes, African yoga has, con has uh, contributed to the commercialization and yes, African yoga has um, grounded um, African culture in, you know, Af so um, Kemetic yoga and African yoga and black people doing yoga is the same as um, any other kind of population doing yoga. What I argue in the book is that um, 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 Tiffany King has a wonderful, uh, uh, she's a colleague of mine at Georgia State University, and she has this book called The Black Shoals. And she's talking about the relationship of, of African Americans to Native Americans. And I see that, you know, outside of the purview of white space. I see that there's an opportunity and there's conversations that Black people and Indian people have had. And we see now with um, definitely with the nomination of Kamala Harris as the vice president, right? That there's discussions that can be had between black and brown people that have nothing to do with whiteness. Does that let all black people off the hook from making money or, um, you know, doing things like um, um, hypersexualizing yoga or like, you know, so no, it's not inherent that black people are, um, um, are going to be any more or less exploitative or, um, you know, capitalist based um, when in our approach, but work like um, Tiffany King's um, The Black Shoals allows us an opportunity to have these discussions that are not um, based in or even, you know, that, that, that are out of the white gaze. Um, and that's what, that's what I'm trying to do here. And that's why I foreground um, Indian women yoga scholars um, that, um, you know, that so I'm not having this conversation by myself. Thank you. Uh, it was really wonderful listening to you, ma'am. Uh, as so much of participants have mentioned uh, regarding your presentation, it was really a transparent speculation, a clear, frank, beautiful presentation, a really useful presentation in the pandemic situation, very nice presentation, lucid explanation. Uh, it's completely fire, fire in your mind, but so cool in your heart. Ah! So cool, really awesome. <laughs> oh my God, I love you. I'll it's, take it's a, it. I'll, thank you so much. Fire in my mind, but cool in my heart. I will take that. Uh, thank you all so much for affording me the grace to be here. I'm grateful, I'm humbled. Um, please reach out. Uh, the, if you go to my website, professorevans.net, there's a lot of resources. And then um, blackwomensyogahistory.net. Um, there's a lot of information there. I really want to continue this discussion um, between black and brown people. Um, I think the world absolutely needs what India has given to the world in terms of yoga. Um, you know, not to, but not in a way that fetishizes it, that makes it like, ooh, that's all Indian people have ever done. Um, in, a, in like a real time way where we start to connect um, um, outside of predominantly white spaces, um, not to exclude white people, but to really understand there's a lot of healing that needs to happen in the world. And I do think that um, black women um, have a lot to offer to this discussion, but the discussion doesn't happen without you all. Thank you so much for joining us, ma'am. It was really wonderful uh, and to have you here. Um, we really thank you so much. It was really a wonderful presentation, ma'am. Thank you thank for joining you. us. Thank you. And the, the video is on YouTube, so anyone can access yes, it later. Yes.
Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Peace, y'all. Thank you, participants. We wanted to come in and active participation. So here we have the next career resource person with us, uh, another uh, eminent speaker, uh, Ms. Pierre Mutumina, Assistant Professor of English, Manar Thirumale Nayapur College, Madurai. Um, good point. Yes, I could see her. Uh, so I have a few words regarding uh, her. So she has a wide range of uh, research in American literature and feminism. Uh, I hope uh, you will all enjoy her session because uh, uh, she has a very good knowledge of uh, research in what she is doing and uh, happy learning. Uh, listen to her, enjoy the session. Uh, welcome, Motumina. You unmute yourself. Yes, yes, once. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, one and all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kartika, ma'am, for inviting me for this presentation. And for an inexperienced person like me, this means a lot because to share a platform with experienced, uh, eminent stalwarts, and I'm just a novice in this academia. Uh, I'm, I'm just one year of experience in this teaching. And uh, I have chosen this topic, digital feminism and overview, because I think I have, as a millennial, I have some experience in this uh, area. And uh, I'll begin my presentation. So I'll share my screen. Mom, I, uh, could you just enable my screen sharing, Mom? It's, it's not allowing me to do yes, that. Yes, you can do that. Yes, you yes, can do that now. Yes, Mom. Uh, so digital feminism and overview is my topic and digital feminism. So basically what defines digital feminism? It is an activism or engagement with feminist and feminist ideologies uh, on the internet. So especially we've been seeing lots of waves of uh, feminisms like first wave, second wave and third wave. And now we are getting into this phase called digital feminism. And why digital feminism now? For example, why, why are we getting into this new terrain, new area? Technology is a powerful tool of resistance. And especially during this time, in this pandemic, we are understanding that technology is very essential for the basic survival in this world. We, we, we thought of food, uh, water or shelter was our basic necessity, but now technology has become so inevitable that we cannot imagine a world without technology. We have all become tech savvy within a decade or so we, we cannot just live without our mobiles. We cannot imagine a world or a life without uh, electronic gadgets because we have become one with it. And why feminism? Why digital feminism especially? Because it, it is multidimensional and it creates awareness on socio-political issues, gender and sexuality, and pro-intersectional politics. Uh, before this, during traditional waves of feminism, it was not all inclusive, but digital feminism is not like that. It, it is inclusive and it is easily accessible by all people over the world and especially intersectional feminism. Uh, we tend to talk about race inequality as separate from uh, inequality based on gender, class, sexuality or immigrant status. What's often missing is how some people are subject to all of these. So there are some people who suffer from all of these things like uh, because of race, because of their gender, uh, because of the strata, the class and everything. So how these people come together in one platform? And that is how digital humanities emerged. But digital feminism is again a part of digital humanities. And because this workshop is completely dedicated to the welfare of women and uh, especially dealing with the gender narratives, have chosen this digital feminism, which forms a tiny vein from this digital humanities. 
and especially digital feminism is important in this particular era because to counteract patriarchal dominance it is desirable to develop discursive approaches that emphasize interconnectedness on or relational thinking uh, no man is an island as we all know so if we want to assert our feminism feminist dominance over the world we we don't want to be dominant as such but but still we have to have we have to assert our power and that happens only with this interconnectedness we have to be connected with each other just like lisa or true puts it and that happens if we that that only happens if we fight against the hegemonical structures uh, the, the structures that are dominant and prevents us from exploring technology that prevents us from exploring the digital world and and that only happens if we form an uh, an interconnectedness with people all over the world and this happens this can really happen with social media right now and especially through blogs other websites web blogs micro blogs everything is available over there and that is twitter tumblr facebook and what not and these are such instruments that makes us all come together and form a particular unity towards uh, towards fighting the hegemony towards fighting the patriarchal dominance so as i was just asking why should we go into digital feminism and what differs uh, what makes digital feminism different from the mainstream feminism the traditional feminists or the mainstream feminists especially had the three waves or four waves of feminism as we have all learned but that but each wave of feminism was focusing on a particular uh, concept or a particular uh, right that is meant exclusively for women but digital feminism is all inclusive and uh, while the mainstream feminists were all fighting were were all fi uh, fighting for this pub public demonstrations legal challenges and commercial boycotts it was difficult to mobilize all these people for the traditional feminists but virtual feminists find it easier because it is easy when we are all interconnected just like uh, uh, the last slide that we saw if we are all together we could easily uh, we, should, we could easily be united and create a change in the world and transform the world and because that that is possible only with digital uh, feminism only with interconnectedness only with networking carol gilligan is a famous psychologist and she gives a complete distinction between men and women i'm just giving this to to get an idea as to how masculinity is different from femininity and what is the behavior of males uh, of of both the males and females in relation to computer mediated language so the masculine especially the gender masculine as we see it they are all the objective individual and abstract uh, these are the characters that qualify a person to be masculine like objectivity individuality and abstraction and they they have they all have this uh, ladders of hierarchy within them while feminine characters are contextual relational and personal carol gilligan frames all these characteristics with respect to an interview that she uh, uh, that she conducted among male and female participants and with their tests of reasoning so the feminine the, the female candidates their answers show that they were contextual relational and personal so whatever it is they take everything subjectively whereas their male counterparts took that as abstracted way uh, objectively and they do not connect easily and especially their computer mediated language and especially if we ourselves look into the conversations the communication that is happening over social media uh, like a twitter or uh, any other uh, um, social networking sites we could see that uh, the male language or the female language that happens in social media are completely different like just it is the the, the men use direct terse confrontative languages and sometimes it also has uh, components that, that and sometimes it also has flaming so what is this flaming it is nothing but an 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 annoying trait or something like an irritation irritation remark uh, that harms other people that but that doesn't mean that the females do not do that but still um, the proportion is fairly higher with male counterparts but while we look at this computer mediated language through uh, to, through the female uh, uh can through the female users in in social networking platforms they have the rhetoric of politeness support and personalization so if at all a person suffers and if he asks for help if, if a male person if a male suffers and asks for help to a uh, fellow male 
and he doesn't receive the same amount of warmth and support a female receives because they have a uh, polite they have support and they have personalization they get connected easily but that doesn't happen with a male so that is the voice is different the conversation seems to be different the different voice of feminist discourse historically ignored in favor of the more dominant masculine approach so we do not know whether this different voice is because of biological lineage or whether it was it's because of social customs but still it is different but this different voice sometimes get muffled gets muffled because they are, are or either they become misinterpreted or dehumanized because of the masculine approach because of the men coming into the platforms and taking uh, control of all this social media or social networking so that is the reason why we have assorted to digital feminism to to make women come together and fight for change to fight for right for their own and uh, i have actually chosen two books uh, to to just trace the origin of digital uh, di digital world especially and why women came into technology in the first and then how they got transformed from technology to cyberspace so first of all it is judy wachman's uh, book called feminism conference technology it was a ground breaking work which was released in 1991 and this book deals with technology uh, just like the name indicates but the technology as how men deal with it. men's monopoly of technology as sources of power during the earlier times we all know that tech, um, men are really masters in dealing with technology and stuff and especially uh, judy wachman uh, relates to lots of uh, machines like um, uh, refrigerators cars and all such technologies that that are especially favorable to men and they have the knowledge to operate it and all that and she insists that the feminist groups and campaigns attempted to break men's grip on technical expertise and to win greater autonomy on women so women also have to have uh, their control on technology and that happens only if they get to learn all these things and apart from that they have to they have to be given an opportunity to learn technology for examples before the science of technology came into existence some feminisms like radical cultural or eco feminism emphasized gender difference and celebrated what they see as specifically feminine so these forms of feminisms the radical cultural and eco feminisms they all emphasized that the, the both the male and female are different so they they are not essentially one and they also women as greater humans because they had this uh, inherent traits of because they're all delicate and they are inherent caregivers they are pacifists they nurture people and all all such stuff so radical feminism cultural eco feminism or completely different from techno feminism that emerged later later parts in the of the 20th century so how did the impact of new technology affect women impact of new technology over women was not easy at the beginning but then at a slow pace women were learning to adopt to the new developments over the particular era and there was introduction of word processors into the office that provided the focus for much earlier research uh, this book does not deal entirely with the cyberspace or digital world as i told earlier technology that included everything ranging from uh, cars refrigerators food processors and all that but i have just called out what is important for us because this serves as an origin into or uh, as a path breaking uh, way into the digital world and also watchman argues whether technology will liberate or oppress women that is a question that she poses throughout the book and she tries to get an answer for that or is technology inherently patriarchal and if it is patriarchal how do we make it available for everybody how do we make the female or uh, how do we make the women get access to technology and how do we uh, make the women masters of technology so that is what this book discusses so this book is just a forerunner to uh, the digital world we could say but the next book again by the same author judy watch uh, which is named as techno feminism which was released some a decade or more later that is in the year 2005 that provided a clear understanding of cyberspace and this book had some two or three chapters totally dedicated to the world of cyberspace 
and this gave a new definition to the digital world to the cyberspace and people and especially in the early start of the 21st century as people were getting more access to technology and to the digital world it was very beneficial to learn new concepts and theories from this book so she asks again she poses the question whether technology or techno feminism portrays to be a utopian world or a dystopian world virtual reality is of freedom and liberation from conventional gender roles that is the first thing she asserts we all have to agree with her we, we uh, when we go into when we get into the virtual world there is a complete break from the conventional gender roles that we've all been doing we all lose our identity and become one with the technology that there is uh, the lines are blurred there is a complete blend there we lose we forget ourselves we forget our own gender identity when we get into virtual reality cyber feminists have coffee in cyber cafes surf the internet and imagine a gender free future in cyberspace so they imagine a gender free future we are not sure whether that is possible in this world in the apocalyptic world but still these cyber feminists they all imagine a gender free future electronic networks help in global information exchange and for participatory democracy so digital space is not just a space where we could just uh, form connections with people all over the world it is also a place where we could exchange knowledge where we could uh, get lots of information glo globally and that happens with mixing of with well forming connections with having social networking with lots of people from all over the world that becomes participatory democracy we get to know a lot of things we we learn a lot of things through this digital world so it is not about forming fighting for a cause yes fem, fem, the fem, uh, the women are all fighting for a cause but that also means that they are all uh, on the uh, search for knowledge as well because they are, are in a participatory democracy so in this account the world wide web is seen as beyond the control of any one group now no one is uh, no one is out no one cannot just not participate in world wide web it is beyond the control of any one group anyone can go and access world wide web while it was not possible with the conventional gender roles then then were given specific roles as to do what they are meant to do while that is not uh, seen in digital world and the other important point that watchman tells us that is bodily transcendence in cyberspace and easy engagement in the public realm of interna international politics till then international uh, participating in the public realm participating in protests or uh, fights was something which was not meant for women which was not permitted for women and they have to go to the streets to fight they have to go to the streets to uh, to re to rebel against structures but then when this happened when digital world came into existence in cyberspace the participating in public realm was easy public participating in with international politics became easier because it, it it enabled bodily transcendence anyone can go and access uh, people of all strata can have their own control over digital world so it became easier for women uh, to be who they want to be without constricting themselves without restricting themselves with who they want to be and digital world enabled them to become this new selves to to form to frame a new identity uh, to uh, on their own without depending upon any other people they can be who re they really want to be and watchman also tells that the contemporary use of the web by transnational corporations financial markets global criminal networks military strategists and international races is a means to evade social regulation entrench political power political control and concentrate economic power so what does this mean sometimes uh, technology is not always beneficial we always have to see uh, the negative effects of it and when that happens and especially uh, it, it it is not controlled by anybody we could find any content online which is not suitable for all age groups which is not suitable for um, the, the innocent children or innocent women over there because this the these the digital world especially is built is concentrating on one thing that is economic power they just forget that they are uh, all uh, they all have to be operating on some, something uh, social they, they do not they evade social regulation they do not have political control and they only concentrate on economic power and that is something which is a demerit of digital world 
and then she goes on to talk about the ubiquitous cyborg uh, which has become an icon for the idea that the boundaries between the biological and the cultural and between the human and the machine have been dissolved just like dawn of haraway's uh, a cyborg manifesto which was a landmark uh, essay that told us that uh, gender need not be gender at all that there is a mixture of identities it can be dissolved the genders can be completely blurred like the next point it serves the link between feminine femininity and maternity as these new body technologies do disrupts the categories of the body sex uh, gender and sexuality that means that that there is no a sort of an identity or female identity or a male identity at all there is a blend of all these things if somebody uh, is uh, if this concept of cyborg cyborg just means that these sort of structures this discrimination is completely lost over there for for the for the women who have been captive to biology for the women who have been worried about their appearances this was liberating but for others it was not we do not know whether this is ex ex extreme whether this is exactly uh, suitable for this digital world but still bachman says that uh, this is both positive and negative in this apocalyptic view techno science is deeply implicated in the masculine project of the domination and control of women and nature like frankenstein's monster like if we go on the same way if we become so one with technology or if we become so focused on transforming ourselves to come back to, to just come away with this gender identity and all that then what it will lead eventually is we will uh, land upon this frankenstein's monster and it is essential uh, not to do that and it is it, it becomes difficult to to just put an end to that so while haraway's work has stimulated important new insights into the gender power relations of technology she too but even more so her acolytes risk fetishizing new technologies the so technologies cannot be fetishized it has to be uh, put under certain limits we cannot just delve into technologies and forget the real world it has to be uh, under limits the virtuality of cyberspace is seen to spell the end of naturalized biological embodiment as is as the basis for gender difference so the virtuality of cyberspace ensures that there is completely uh nullifying of the gender identity gender difference and how this happens so cyber feminism is actually a reaction to the pessimism of the 1980s feminist approaches as we already saw about the cultural feminism the radical feminism and the eco feminism that stressed the inherently masculine nature of techno science so technology was initially masculine and people were trying to make it uh, feminine or we, we couldn't say feminine we, they were trying to get more women get access to technology so in contrast cyber feminism emphasizes women's subjectivity and agency and the pleasures emanent in digital technologies so cyber feminism uh, ensures that there is something positive in technology and it's high time that women make use of it technological innovations have been pivotal in the fundamental shift in power from men to women uh, and this is just uh, asserted by sedi plant and the digital revolution especially heralds the decline of the traditional hegemonic structures and power bases of male domination because it represents a new kind of technical system so the total hegemony is lost over there with the digital revolution taking place and the net cyberspace virtuality virtual reality and the matrix epitomizes the shape of a new disturbed non linear world so that there is not a definite order there is a uh, uh, this is the world of uh, cyberspace or the digital world is completely unpredictable and sedi plant is again telling that cyberspace is out of man's control virtual reality destroys his identity digitalization is mapping his soul and at the peak of his triumph the culmination of his machinic erections man confronts a system he built for his own protection and finds it is female and dangerous so the technology that was once exclusively meant for male has now become female because of the involvement of the women in technology in digital world and all that now it becomes shock to uh, the men that technology or cyberspace has become a world which is ex exclusively meant for women and how did that become possible that proves instrumental uh, that that in intersectional feminism as well as this digital feminism and now we would just get into we'll we'll just see some of the blogs uh, for contemporary feminist activism 
that brings all people together, that mobilizes women all over the world to fight for a common cause. And uh, for example, skin stories is, is again, um, it's actually, um, it's from Medium, uh, the platform that we all know, the social networking platform, where people write articles. And this skin stories is uh, uh, the name of the platform on Medium, a digital publication on disability, sexuality, and gender. Skin Stories is the first and only publication in India dedicated to publishing fresh, urgent perspectives on disability, sexuality, and gender. So we could see that uh, by in the article that I have attached here, it reads that my family colluded to have me put in met mental health facility. This is the story of how I survived. It is written by Jill Mill Breckenridge, but the name here is again changed. So these are some of the articles written by women who come from all uh, status of the society and how they survived something. With this proves as an inspiration to all the other women who come and read. So they form a sort of a collaborative approach to tackling issues and talking about the problems they have faced all along. So this becomes more or less like a, a platform uh, where, where people unite, where women unite and fight for a common cause. And this also includes people from the disabled people and uh, the queer, the transgenders, and uh, the non-binary ones, and like LGBTQ, the, the whole uh, strata of the whole society. So this is uh, Skin Stories, which is uh, which is uh, the, which is present in Medium. And the next one is Everyday Sexism Project. This is again a blog, but still they have Twitter handles as well. So especially during this age, during this uh, contemporary era, we cannot call ourselves a feminist without being uh, com commented by many as being uptight, prudish, or a militant feminist. So we are going to be labeled by all these terms. If we are going to portray ourselves as liberal or uh, feminist or anything, whatever we are, we are going to be named. We are going to be labeled. So Everyday Sexism Project was actually meant to, was, uh, to it's, it's, a, it's a place to record stories of sexism faced on a daily basis basis by ordinary women in ordinary places and to promote equality. So women have to record their uh, sufferings, uh, their, uh, uh, their difficulties that they face on their day-to-day -day lives somewhere or the other. And this platform, Everyday Sexism Project, meant that you could share anything over there. It need not be anything big or anything small. It need not be outrageous. Because, and there are also some situations, some circumstances where women are not allowed to say anything or not to complain anything because that is completely natural. That is just the way things are. But still, that is wrong. And that is the whole motto of this Everyday Sexism Project. It emphasizes that whatever things that, uh, how, how, in whatever form uh, the women are harassed, it can be reported. And the help and support list currently focuses on UK organizations, but it does include a link to an international inventory of hotlines, shelters, refuges, crisis centers, and men's organizations searchable by country. So this everyday sexism project was meant exclusively for United Kingdom alone, but then they all have uh, separate hotlines and shelters, the, the numbers, and they know how to approach the other no non-governmental organizations that are present in other countries as well. So this is more like a platform where the women can express themselves. It's more like uh, they can feel solidarity. They, they can form collaborative collaborations with all other women over the world because it, it's more like sharing something where you sharing something on a platform when they don't have anybody to share to. And the next one is publisher or publish her. Publisher is a call to action by female publishing leaders to address their industry's entrenched gender imbalances and drive an international agenda for change. So this is also an attempt to create, uh, to, to just highlight on the gender-based inequities that have been long characterized over there in the, in the world of publishing. So be it in any field, there are going to be uh, gender inequities and how to address these changes. And uh, that happened when these female publishing leaders together, they formed a group to combat all these things. And it also included uh, that it, it also meant that they're they fighting for a common uh, ground. They're fighting for a common cause and how individual can support female colleagues. So they gave support to the female authors, especially, and how to publish their own works and uh, by encouraging them to publish more works, to publish, to write more and all that. 
so this is uh, an organization that is meant for that and uh, uh, the next one is so this is just an example rupi kaur's books is uh, rupi kaur is a very famous poet uh, a new generation poet which uh, i i guess everybody would have been familiar with and she faces a lot of criticism as well uh, like we are not going to comment on that but still as of now she is one of the best selling poets in the world and her work has been translated to more than 42 languages and her just she has she has written only two books and they have become new york best sellers and uh, they have sold over 8 million copies so rupi kaur's story is also a little bit different so when she was 21 years old she wrote uh, she she is actually a poet who writes many poems and she wanted to get them published but then she did not find any appropriate platforms so she was going after one publisher after another who rejected her completely and then she wanted to uh publish an anthology of poetry a collection of poetry which was also not possible and she was uh thinking of various other options she was trying to get the help of many people but then it was of no avail at all and that was and that is how and that is how the situation for every uh feminist for, for every women author is for every new generation women poet is we do not know how to publish or where to publish or who to approach and that there is something and women were hesitant to go and publish their works as well and that is when she realized she had to self publish her work and she uh, published it through this platform called creative space uh, just like a kindred publishing platform and then and then she became a whole internet phenomenon through her in instagram posts through her twitter posts and all that so rupi kaur became just a famous best selling poet because she had a strong hold on her social media platforms especially instagram she had uh, loads of followers uh, who were eager to read her poetry who were encouraging her to become the poet that she wanted to be so just at a very young age she was able to achieve all these things through the digital platforms through social networking and her work mainly touches on uh, love loss trauma healing feminism and migration and she also have has the habit of drawing some uh, uh, minute designs at her place like like some small drawings to help enhance her poetry which is completely new to the world of poetry and she also uh, is has completely rejected uh, the writing norms as well so when you just look at the words milk and honey the sun and her flowers there is no capital letters being employed she only uses small letters so this is this is again a way of rejecting hegemonical structures uh, and again when we look at the next thing hashtag #feminism digital feminism will be incomplete if we do not talk about hashtag #feminism and we know especially as i it's mentioned me too everybody we we are aware of this movement me too why lotta pinchot or lahu ka lagan bring back her girl these are some of the prominent movements that have been trending uh, in twitter in um, various other social media platforms over the last decade or so so i have just given some examples about uh, you know these are some of the tweets that were present that represents this hashtag #feminism the first one is he said he would change he promised it was the last time i believed him he lied this hash, uh, #hashtag is why i stayed so why i stayed refers to the people who were suffering domestic violence or uh, with, with the people who who were uh, who they did not want to live with but still they believed them and uh, that is that's what is why i stay but that meant completely wrong the second one i shouldn't have told i shouldn't have to hold my car keys in hand like a weapon and check over my shoulder every few seconds when i walk at night that is yes all women women face usually this happened yes all women came into existence when one person a totally misogynistic person shot six women out of you know disrespect out of hatred or something so this tweet written by sofia bush tells that she has security issues while uh, wandering over there just like why loiter and then next one everyday sexism uh, as we saw earlier is uh, they have their twitter handle as well and this is interesting as well too i come up with a decent idea in meeting i'm ignored minutes later man expresses same idea is congratulated on brilliance so this is uh, an office atmosphere where men are given more importance uh, than women where men's ideas are being appreciated while women's are not so 
this is just uh, another one like girls like us is for all trans women regardless of color but all who lend their voice to amplify ours knows that intersectionality matters so it's this uh, tweet this hashtag girls like us is for trans women and just like that bring back our girls is something uh, was for uh, nigerian girls who were um, who were kidnapped by the terrorist group called boko haram and uh, there are many hashtags like this that have been trending uh, over the past decade even during the correct time in the current time so hashtag feminism also proves instrumental in digital feminism because uh, this helps this helps to make the women unite get united and uh, it makes them come out of their uh, um, silence it it just makes them get out of their uh, restrictions and to say something in the open which is which, which is even it which could even be a taboo but still they come out and say something in the open because they have to and the next one is uh, blank noise it is an ngo organization which is based in bangalore and uh, it, it, they also have an have a website where we could uh, all join and participate uh, in the uh, taking agency to end sexual and gender based violence so this Uh, organization is meant exclusively for that to end sexual and gender based violence and they it is actually taken from the website that means that their motto is to mobilize communities to create safe spaces and uh, they propose ideas for collaboration ideas for social change they also collaborate with colleges to educate young girls about uh, sexual and gender based violence and how they have to be aware of all such practices and how they have to be ready to face anything if at all there is a chance and i never ask for it is actually related to the women the dress wear uh, the, the the women they uh, the dress the women they wear especially uh, about uh, the case that happened in the year 2012 so this organization blank noise just emphasizes that it is not about the clothes the harassment that women experience or the violence it, it should not be about the clothes and the next one i need to sleep is quite interesting because uh, when we just look at a comment which is made by shakina parveen from bihar i have never slept in the open i have never come this far away from my village i felt like a free bird in the open sky I experienced freedom or azadi men can nap anywhere uh, but women do we have the power to nap anywhere when we have to no i don't think so we we sleep at a particular place when we have when we experience security when we are completely satisfied that we will be safe in a particular place but we do not have that we cannot just go and sleep in a park we cannot just go and sleep in a place that we find interesting even if, if we are tired we are not meant to do that but then this blank noise made people to go and sleep in particular places wherever they want to because they just wanted to create an awareness that of course women can sleep wherever they want to it is not not just meant for men alone now when got the next one action shiro's project which is also uh, which is also a, a part of a project from this blank noise walk walk slow or uh, walk tall walk idle we can walk the way that we want to but women are we are we walking the way that we really want to while we are walking we are socially uh, conditioned to walk in such a way that we we just uh, have to fulfill the expectations of the society we are supposed to walk with heads bent down maybe maybe you could just say that it is not happening in this uh, particular uh, period in this period it's all not happening but still it is happening in many villages in remote areas so this project action shiros meant that women can walk anywhere and the way they want it to it's not that they have to walk in a particular position it's not that they should walk with their heads bent down or it's not that they should walk fast or walk slow or anything they can smile while they walk they can have their own pace they can walk, they can walk just the way they want to so this is again a project project that uh, blank noise uh, employed where women were walking on uh, on our streets on uh, different areas however they want to they do not have to follow a particular norm even on the way they walk the next one is uh, women writers project so we were we were seeing many like uh, social media platforms and blogs and all that but this is very different this is meant for archives 
uh, till the ma mainstream feminism, when mainstream feminism was all happening, we, we have had a lot of authors who were writing about a uh, lot of works like Betty Friedman, Simone de Beauvoir, and all that. We have been reading their phenomenal works, yes. We have been getting access to them, yes. Uh, via books, Virginia Woolf, we are all familiar with their works. And but what happens if we do not have access to our internet? Will we will we be really having access over books physically? Will that be possible? So Women Writers Project is uh, actually a kind of an archive related thing where it meant that digitizing women's writing, researching, and theorizing technologies, uh, representation, exploring new methods of uh, scholarly communication, and supporting scholarship. So digital representation, that is what is happening. So we have to digitize women's writing. It's not that uh, women's writing uh, should be exclusively meant on books. If women's writings are digitized uh, all over the world, then we could even access uh, a, a writer, a less familiar author from a less familiar country. But we are only aware of only the classic authors uh, who are just coming from a particular uh, society. We are not aware of the writers, even the trans we do not get access to. But Women Writers Project makes sure that we get access to all such uh, uh, digitized versions of women's writing. So Women Writers Online is an internationally recognized digital connection of women's writing in English, which has made pre-Victorian women's writing visible within the new digital canon, which means that we could access uh, women's writing belonging to any period. It doesn't mean that certain periods have to be uh, ignored or anything like that. We can just get access to lots of uh, writing, especially the pre-Victorian or uh, Renaissance era or Reformation era. Everything has, is accessible through this. So the goal of this women's writing project is not just to read, but read women's books. So uh, uh, till now, as digital humanities was uh, coming into war, it meant that writing especially will be digitized but this women's writers project emphasizes that people read women's works so they have to be an archive exclusively meant for women alone so that promotes the availability of writing by women so when you're writing a particular work this makes sure that it reaches uh, large masses it, it, it reaches uh, all over the world and it includes authors authors unfamiliar to many and all genres and all genres, this is in, uh, this is all encompassing. It doesn't restrict itself to a specific genre. It includes all the genres, uh, need not just be literary or anything. And especially there is an option called keyword in context that is uh, present in this archive that makes us get access to various genres that we really need access to. Whereas this is not possible in a traditional library or something like that. Yes, we can. We, we have digital libraries, but still, uh, this is not possible. Why? Because if we have this option keyword in context, we could just so go for an interdisciplinary work. For example, we could go for uh, a romantic and historical work if we just type two keywords in the archive. So that saves a lot of time, and still, we could get access to a lot of authors who have not been tread upon at all which means that uh, knowledge gets widened and women get recognition all over the world. But the only limitation is that it's completely westernized. Uh, this, this archive does not include all the works from all the remote corners of the world as they are exclusively meant to the Western audience alone. And especially the authorizing integrity is not there. We, we do not, we cannot trust the integrity of this project. We cannot just uh, trust whether it's all um, it's not not plagiarized or anything like that. We do not know about that, but still we can get access to all these archives. And that means that uh, we could read any women's writing in English. Now this is digital uh, storytelling. So till now we have been seeing a lot about social medias and uh, um, digital uh, cyberspace and all that. So digital storytelling, this actually traces back to uh, a little earlier times. Now in this generation, if we need to uh, oppose something, if women find that there is a need to make uh, documentary films and all that, we have a modern days YouTube or we, we can upload a video on YouTube and it can we can make a documentary film and all that. But uh, who can make such things? Only privileged people can do that. One who has access to internet, one who knows the art of 
taking a video or making a documentary film or uploading uploading it can do that but what is this digital storytelling it means that even the underprivileged people even the marginalized people can have access to this so this is nothing but a short first person video narrative created by combining recorded voice still and moving images and music or other sounds so this is what the uh, center center for digital storytelling says so in digital storytelling workshops uh, marginalized women and women's rights activists develop a forum to tell their stories and share their experiences uh, by producing short films about themselves association for progressive communications women's networking support program so this is the name of the program and they go to the underprivileged or marginalized sections of the society and make them share their experiences about what what all the uh, struggles they have had and what are the difficulties they have faced as a woman and how they have been harassed and all such experiences are being recorded into films and they are uploaded so the topics and concerns that were even taboos that uh, they do not get the chance to be shared elsewhere or also taken over here and especially for victims of violence this is a chance to speak about their experiences so everybody gets to uh, have a chance over there they can talk about anything but again there is an important the significant thing here is when they are making such documentary films they always get uh, the approval of the people before publishing it online so the women who also discrimination and further violence when they publish their stories this is the negative part of it so for every positive thing there is a negative trait and that that's what uh, this is all about so when a marginalized woman comes out of her uh, uh, hegemonical structures and when she just goes out to to record her own sufferings and she's she's been made to su suffer further uh, to be uh, to be get gets getting into further violence because uh, they publish their stories because the people who perpetrated such violence will be exposed and the, the people who were the uh, means of discriminating them the people who victimized them will be exposed and that is a danger to them so they try to remain anonymous sometimes so they uh, this is uh, this is something which is really pathetic because they come to share their own troubles but still they risk uh the dangers and they try to remain anonymous so these storytellers or the owners of their stories as explained above they agree on publishing their films or not so it is their decision but still it is more like a vent even if they do not publish it become it, it is it just means that they share it they share it they share it out in the open and that becomes that their burdens are reduced further psychologically they are becoming free and the other thing is the acknowledgement that they get from their peers that there are other women who are also suffering who are also going through the same suffering as they do that makes them understand that we are all following this we are all on the same way everybody is on uh, everybody is facing their own difficulties that makes us understand that we are all together in this journey and what matters is the solidarity that we have to uh, have to have to face things and the other important thing is that and why uh, the reason that, that i have included digital storytelling is that the participants learn to use technology so these underprivileged people these marginalized women who belong to the uh, uh, the lower strata of the society they learn to use the technology and that is uh, the real goal achieved when they just proceed on to this next one what are the challenges uh, in uh, digital feminism so many say that it is less valid or inadequate there is no ground work here at all so when when uh, traditional feminism or mainstream feminism was in vogue people accepted that because women really were fighting for that but in digital world in digital feminism women just sit in their homes they just tweet something they just share something online does that mean they are really participating in the uh, in uh, in the movement so this activism becomes slacktivism because they are just garnering attention online but they they are not really getting into the real fight so an online activists or like keyboard warriors or they are called as performative activists so does that mean it is it less valid or inadequate because there are critics who tell that this is not uh, uh, the real protest or this is not real activism at all and the other thing is cyber bullying which is trolling that women face uh, online whatever you post becomes a meme material nowadays 
and because of this because of this fear that the the, the, the thoughts that they share becomes something to to be ridiculed which, which makes them makes them uh, afraid of posting such things so that becomes they're always getting trolled for whatever they post they become bullied and there is also a consistent privacy breach so uh, just because you post something on twitter with your real name does it mean that you you will not face danger there is a privacy breach they'll come to know you, who you are and either your account will be hacked or uh, some comments will be passed online which is which is not so good at all and this happens to, this always happens with victim blaming so always the women are uh, made to made to understand that they are the victims so whoever whether it is a male or a female the female becomes the victim and there is a ment and the, there is this mental harassment which becomes difficult to come away from so when you are being online uh, even you will be depressed if at all you are getting into trolls and all that even some of the tech talks where women go and uh, talk confidently they are facing a lot of trolls and uh, Uh, and ridicules and mockeries from everyone and that makes them get depressed so that that makes them not from participating online so a feminist or a digital feminist all the time online may face this trolling which is very difficult and that is an essential part of this activism the other important uh, disadvantage is that they have to be available all the time because people will be replying to that uh, uh, tweet or that um post or video post or image post or anything and to that the people should reply if at all you're not replying for the post it means that you are succumbing to the comment you are succumbing to whatever the comment told so which means that the digital feminists should be available online to react to the posts to react to the comments that they are facing and only then it is a win win situation or else it is not and there is this angry feminist trope that we face everywhere so now feminist if you're being called a feminist if you're saying that yourself if you're calling yourself as a feminist then you are also meant to be mockery meant to mockery because uh, this is more like an angry young man trope was becoming famous in the 1950s now it is angry feminist trope when you call yourself a feminist you stand for an equal uh, for a society which which should be egalitarian which stands for an equal for the equality in society but then people do not accept you people do not take you for what you are people misunderstand and misjudge what this word truly means so that means that they do not like uh, when one person calls themselves a feminist so fe feminism has become a derogatory term nowadays so it, it, it's like uh, maybe it's getting meanings that that should not be ascribed to it when we go to the next point that is a loss of identity online so when you go online just like we we saw earlier the gender lines get blurred you do not know whether that whether it is a male or a female you're chatting online with and there is this option to be completely anonymous as well so you do you do you do not even have to know the real name of person you can change the name also uh, that means that there is a severe risk to privacy and there is also a severe risk to oneself as well because uh there is a lot of hackers available online there are also a lot of traitors available online who uh, who just uh, try to hide their real identity and that means that you are risking danger which does not happen in uh, the you know the feminism that we face in the reality that becomes completely different but this problem is a major uh, disadvantage that we face in the digital world but we do not have unfortunately we do not have any other uh, um, options to 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 curb this because people can make can identify themselves as any gender when they are joining a social networking platform and there is no integrity over there at all nobody can no, nobody can have access over over it for example in life on the screen Sherry Turkel enthuses about the potential for people to express multiple and often unexplored aspects of the self to play with their identity and to try out new ones the obese can be slender the beautiful plain the nerd is sophisticated so which means that we could express ourselves as uh, whoever we want to be we can we can just uh, express ourselves as to be multiple and often unexplored aspects of the self 
I, I can be a, a woman, but when I go to social media, I can post myself as a man and I can chat with people as a man. And I can change my identity uh, to uh, the, the way I want to. I can make myself, I can uh, make myself feel like I'm biologically different from who I really am. I can call myself slender even if I'm obese and I can call myself plain or if I'm beautiful or I can call myself nerdy if I'm sophisticated. We can just change our identities online because there is complete anonymity over there and nobody can really come and check that. Despite of all the uh, legal actions that people have to face uh, in case of such situations like cyber crimes and all that, still there are people who misuse that who misuse their identity and they get into a lot of problems. So even after, even the educated woman falling prey for such, uh, for, for, such for, for such men, for such things that are available online, because they, they, they are just vulnerable and they easily give up. Uh, they, they easily believe whatever people say online because they are completely uh, whitewashed or we could say they're completely brainwashed whatever people say online. And that happens in the digital world alone. In real world, it, the chances of it are really less. For example, uh, as Watchman tells in her book, Techno Feminism, so this is an example I just, I took from there. But then again, I thought that it was uh, like a limitation, a challenge that is meant for uh, digital world, digital feminism, especially. So there was, it, it's a story. There was this psychiatrist called Levin, a male psychiatrist, and he was uh, actually chatting with people online in a particular uh, online chatting platform. And people were asking about his profession and work and all that. He was also sharing uh, his own experiences and he had a lot of followers over there and everything. But one day what he did is he changed his gender completely and uh, he posed himself as a woman. And he changed his name to Julie Graham. Uh, just like a normal disabled New York resident. So he completely changed his identity in that chatting platform, like uh, to a disabled woman. And that meant that he was chatting with fellow women as a woman named uh, Julie. And other women could identify himself, could identify with him as uh, a fellow a sister, as fellow people who, who are uh, um, collaborative enough to understand their uh, plights and situations. So this male psychiatrist Levin was actually posing as a female, but then he understood that uh, the, the, the women who are interacting with him now are completely different. They're sharing everything. They're sharing uh, everything because they know that they were talking to a woman. They thought that they were talking to a woman, which they actually didn't. They were talking to a man, but still they thought that they were talking to a woman and were just uh, shedding all their stories and uh, difficulties, their sufferings and everything. And Julie uh, and Levin in the name of Julie understood that completely. And he, he transformed himself to a woman in that digital platform. He became a digital woman completely. And he was posing himself as an empowered, disabled woman who, as, as a female psychiatrist, uh, who was working as a successful female psychiatrist despite being disabled. And that identity uh, made him one over the other women because they could, they could, the other women were really inspired to see such a, uh, an empowered, disabled person sitting over there, a psychiatrist. If that, that means that they could, they could become beneficial, they, they could become good people, they could be, uh, reaching greater heights just like julie graham so uh, these are the challenges that digital world provides to us so to sum up why the digital world is provides us an inclusive en environment it gives us a multi-dimensional environment and everybody the, so the social media especially offers accessibility for all of us and uh, the fact that technology is a social construct opens up fresh possibilities for feminist scholarship and action. So it's accessible for everybody. Technology is present everywhere, but maybe the rural, even uh, the rural areas are also uh, accomplished with internet platforms right, right now with digital, uh, and they are also digitally equipped and all that. So it, it, it opens up fresh possibilities for feminist scholarship and action. But the thing is, women are exploited in the digital world. We have to accept that fact. Women are vulnerable, just like uh, we mentioned before. That means that, but that doesn't mean that they are not empowered. Women are equally empowered and they are exploited. Uh, it, it is like, um, 
they can be empowered if they want to but still they are subjected to all the risks that are present in the digital world and they cannot just exclude themselves from that and some innocent women who do not have uh, who do not have a shrewdness or who do not have access to a lot of worldly knowledge they get just uh, at, um, they they just become pawns to this digital world and they get exploited because of that and then uh, sadi plans again how much to the internet closely echoes marshall mcluhan's famous aphorism the medium is the message and she acknowledges his legacy so it is the the medium which is the digital world that is the message it could either make one person or ma one person like it, it's technology is more like a double edged weapon so we could either form virtual communities through virtual platforms and enable women and people to grow together or else we can become uh, we, we could even be destroyed we could be uh, destroyed by feminism or uh, digital feminism because we do not know who is uh, who and in, in the platform because it is comp- there is complete anonymity over there but again the one thing that uh, uh, with which i want to just presentation is digitalization is a free it it makes us just free it makes us just um transport ourselves from one place to the other we could just travel over the world staying in one particular place so we could just forget the world and go anywhere and we could assume whoever whatever gender we want to be whatever identity we want to be completely rid of all the restraints and the constrictions that we have over here completely getting rid of uh, stereotypes and everything that women are uh, labeled to be yes thank you there ends my presentation thank you so much it was really an informative uh, presentation Uh, as uh, i said in the beginning of your session uh, you people will enjoy your uh, lecture so i could see that from the chat box so people are commenting participants are commenting and appreciating your presentation can we take some questions sure ma'am yes ma'am um can we call digital feminism as fourth world war of feminism post world war ma'am post no, no, world of feminism world- fourth world of feminism world wave of feminism fourth yes yes of course we can because it marks the end of the third wave feminism in the 1990s and after that we are switching over to the fourth wave and now we are getting into this digital era we could definitely call this uh, fourth wave feminism but then uh, digital feminism is is in a regard complete it's, it's a little bit different from fourth world feminism but still it is uh, a branch of fourth world feminism we could call like that is yes, uh, next question the issues discussed in digital feminism will be the same that are scattered in other branches like liberal radical black marxist eco feminism etc so in that case what is the need for a new branch of feminism we need a new branch of feminism because uh, digital feminism encompasses all these traits uh, in uh, liberal feminism or radical feminism there is a clear gender divide as uh, we discussed earlier there is a clear discrimination between men and women whereas in digital feminism we do not find that yes uh, there is a complete need for studying digital feminism especially as a part of digital humanities or what we call as feminist digital humanities but uh, the distinction or the discrimination is blurred in this digital world whereas in radical or liberal feminism uh, the 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 gender divide is completely there there is discrimination over there while in uh, digital feminism we do not find it as much so that is the reason why we should venture into digital feminism and especially in this time in this pandemic time where we are all assorting to everything digital i think we all should be uh, getting into this uh, digital feminism uh there is an observation from a participant i believe the main core of digital feminist uh feminist is one who fight against rapism in open uh, is that observation right can, uh pardon me ma'am can can i just hear it again uh a uh, observation i believe the main core of digital feminist feminist or digital uh, uh she has to feminist yes ma'am like that so i mean uh, 
uh, is one who fight against rapism in open yes yes ma'am definitely uh, got like an observation here yes yes definitely i believe so because uh, the goal of digital feminism is making women come out of their uh, uh, restrictions because they have to talk about taboos they have they have to talk about sufferings that have that have been suffering so far and uh, uh, even talking about rape is something which is been muffled over certain people in certain sections or certain strata in the society so they have to talk about that also and that becomes possible especially with this me too movement where the people came and reported all the harassments that they have been suffering online or offline and even uh, prominent people were taken into uh, were were uh, taken into um, legal action because of that and so i believe that such uh, um, Uh, rapism or whatever it is should be expressed openly and that is the main goal of digital feminism because women have to talk about that yes, yes. so in same way another observation from your presentation feminist the digital humanities emphasizes the role of women feminists and cyber feminists in technology overturning ideas such as men invented the internet yes of course men invented the internet men invented the technology but then women have come to the fore and uh, we are making changes in the world because we have been uh, learning in a uh, collaborated way and we have been making ripples all over the world because of the virtual communities because of uh, as the web of interconnectedness that we call yes men created the internet but women are making waves Uh, women are now coming to the fore and taking the lead in their hands because they want to change the world they want to change their own lives so i i agree with that yes ma'am uh is uh, connected to this uh, observation i read a report stated women scored a lot during the covid lockdown and many had no opportunity to record or file a complaint Uh, later the cyber group created uh, various options and one option that was easy to complain was through email and what so is the coded an observation regarding this case yes it's an observation and the yeah. question will be uh, did uh, is is uh, did techno feminism contribute to giving agency to the queer and uh, transgender groups the techno feminism give agency to the uh, yes 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 contribute to contribute to giving agency to the queer and transgender groups yeah queer and the transgender groups uh, absolutely yes uh, techno feminism was um, was in vogue during the early 2000s and after that we could see uh, the venture into cyber feminism and then digital feminism but still techno feminism was also instrumental uh, in catering to the needs of the queer people as well they were also having the advantage but i would not say that uh, they, they were not getting their rights as much as they do right now and especially in this uh, situation especially in this cyberspace digital world right now but still techno feminism was also catering to the needs of uh, the trans people the queer people and all of them because especially the concept of cyborg was instrumental in this uh, gender fluidity there was no gender identity at all because of the combination of both male female counterparts and which is the concept of cyborg is completely different and that meant that it was also catering to the needs of the queer people so yes ma'am next question although the rights are being presented but are we really ensuring the respect for our female counterpart for example at present whatever is going on netflix rounding a series cuties it is a special chat for the female children showcase that uh, the west is trying to depict yes that depends upon uh, each person that is totally subjective uh, respect to women uh, there are many men who respect women over internet there are many people who treat men uh, so who treat women with respect but there are also men who treat uh, who, who treat women in a wrong way so i th- i guess that depends upon each people and about netflix I- i'm not sure i've uh, watched that thing but i guess it depends upon each and every other person it is completely subjective if if a person makes sure that the person decides that he has to treat women respectfully and even if he is conditioned to be in such a, in such a situation where he was not 
uh, in a condition socially condition even not to respect the women but even in the digital world he learns to respect the women that is appreciable so it it is it depends upon a person yes uh, next question how far are these keyboard warriors as they are called really successful in bringing about any change in the condition of women especially in a country like india keyboard warriors i would say that they are quite successful uh, i wouldn't say that they are just uh, slacktivists or performative activists that uh, that was mentioned earlier because these keyboard warriors they are essential and they are they are instrumental in all the change that is happening over there even with the me too movement we saw that even in india it created ripples and we could see that many famous people like singers or writers were been on the spotlight because of that even in uh, uh, and and also it mobilizes communities to work together and uh, especially just we saw just we saw in blank noise where is a blue based organization the people come together and they were just taking a nap over there and it all happened with having groups having face facebook groups if you are in a facebook group group or if you are just a part of um, um, being a member in a social media platform that meant that you, you are just associating yourself with that particular community that virtual community and now you you are all just being one you are all being united and you are all fighting so that be, that makes it access that that makes it uh, um, you to be empowered in this uh, digital feminism or digital feministic era uh, i think this is an observation digitalization of women's experiences educate the netizens thereby evoking empathy form sensitive view but with the brother is watching you uh does it call for more secure paths of expressions to avoid precarious situation is it requires more secure se secure paths uh there has to be someone to monitor all such uh, uh the comments or conversations that are happening online but unfortunately we cannot do that and especially with such information explosion that has been happening over online i do not think we can monitor on everything that is happening online and we cannot ensure a secure online experience for each and every woman out there that becomes really difficult yes uh, can we consider virism as a uh, primal reason for cyberbullying and can we consider which which one is the primary reason ma'am uh voyeurism voyeurism yes yes maybe yes uh, now that yes. Uh, yes men or women we are all is the technology is accessible everywhere and uh, we all have our gadgets within us and now even uh, even the, the sites that are banned in some places that has been accessible to people over here which means that it it is propagating voyeurism everywhere and that that is also one of the major reasons that women suffer and uh, women are facing lots of sexual harassment because of such sites and i guess that is also one of the reasons why women are facing uh, violence uh, sexually violated and uh, and stuff like that so uh, internet plays a major role in crimes uh, such as uh, rape or sexual violence and everything uh, does digital feminism remain a, a prerogative only of the educated or and the economically well off no it doesn't mean like that now now that internet is accessible to everybody i guess even the people the women living in rural area are also having android uh, mobile and they can have access to internet they all are active on social media on whatsapp and everything so the thing is they have to uh, know where they have to go to they have to identify the virtual communities everybody has access but the thing is they have to know to who uh, they should join themselves with to who they should associate themselves with it is not just meant for economically well off people alone even the underprivileged can also access uh, get access for that but then uh, there should be awareness there these feminist groups uh, the virtual communities they should create awareness even among the less privileged sections of the society so that they can have their own say in uh, uh, in the digital world as well
As you have spoke of fake identity, what could be the solution to make females strong and let them use their own identity? Again, it depends upon people. There are some women who want to uh, maintain their own real identity on online platforms. We want to just make use of our own names. Who cares? I just use my name. And there are also other women who face a lot of pressure uh, biologically or uh, mentally or physically. They that they just want to be somebody else, just like an escaping phenomenon. They want to be somebody else, they are really or not, they're not in reality. They want to project virtually as someone different. And so they are projecting themselves as different. And we cannot put a stop to this. Even though we have uh, usual checks in digital media platforms and social media and everywhere, we cannot curb this. We cannot put a check on this because uh, again, it's everybody's choice. You can be your, uh, you can maintain your real identity if you want to, or if you want to main maintain a fake one, you want to maintain a different identity uh, from who you really are. Again, it's your, cho it's your own choice. It's up to the women or the men. But the thing is, uh, what I would uh, personally suggest is we have to be ourselves. We have to be maintain. We have to be maintaining our own real identity and stand for who we really are. Uh, only then we can get our space, we could get the rights that uh, in the world that we were fighting for. Are the rural areas really equipped as you are climbing? Uh, rural areas, are, there are towers everywhere, uh, digitally every, you know, the world has been uh, shrinking to a digital village as people are telling. Of course, yes, the rural areas have been uh, equipped also. I would definitely say that because um, as far as I've seen, even the milkman has an Android, has access to uh, um, gadgets, electronic gadgets. That means that everybody can have access uh, to online things. But the thing is, again, they have to be literate enough to understand what is really going on because it, it is not about, uh, they, they have access to it. But the thing is, they have to know how to access or who to access, associate themselves with. That was what I'm saying. Everybody is uh, has access on the internet, has access digitally, even the ones on rural area. But the thing is, they have to be educated enough to know who they should go to with, they, who, who they should uh, uh, form a connection with. The one, the, the groups that really make them understand to grow uh, and to develop together and uh, they have to join with communities, virtual communities like that. It is, they have to understand that social media is not for entertainment purpose alone. It is where women uh, learn, grow together, and uh, they form a world where they can be on par with men. Yes, yes. Uh, an observation or feedback regarding this presentation. Uh, the online platforms gives opportunity to register the voices. Those are otherwise unheard. So the online campaigns have proved the power of techno-feminism to the world. Thank you for the deep analytical presentation. For you, a feedback. Yes. Uh, uh, the one. Uh, being techie is always a matter of practice and uneducated females are getting trapped in the digital platform and also educated females are to an extent manipulating cyberspace especially the youngsters, like uh, eloping, incest, uh, uh, illicit relations, etc. So what is your opinion? Yeah, it happens. Even if you're uneducated, it happens. Even if you're educated, it happens. Like last month, I read an article where a well-qualified doctor in Chennai uh, fell a prey to such online uh, uh, stalkers. So even if you're educated, also it happens. Sometimes women have women have this vulnerability where they forget uh, everything and they believe everything that happens online. Uh, so I guess that we really should not believe everything that that is being posted online. And uh, especially in this world where again, which is filled with information explosion, we have to fact check everything, whether it is true or not. We have to check frequently. We have lots of platforms to check that. We cannot just easily blindly believe whatever is found online. So we have to uh, fact check that and understand whether it is true or not. And only then go after a certain thing. And especially we really should not believe people found online unless and until you know the person before, you're not supposed to 
you are not i am not here to moral police and all that but you're not supposed to give all your your details your privacy otherwise you your privacy gets breached and then you cannot blame anybody we only have the option to go to cyber crime or something like that so we are not supposed to disclose our details and if we are disclosing the details we have to ready to face the risks only at that cost we should be ready to disclose the details thank you sir uh is it possible that digital feminists would play a vital role to lessen the exploitation of women vital role to uh, did not get it ma'am vital role to lessen the exploitation of women to lessen the exploitation of women uh, i i guess digital feminism is a very important tool it's a different is it's a different facet in the feminism uh, uh, arena so far because there has been a lot of developments in the area of feminism we have we have been seeing lots of uh, different feminisms but this digital feminism enables women um, to come together to to be united so i guess it it's a wonderful platform where uh, women can assert their rights and uh, and fight for who they really want to be Regarding that one question, in these days a lot of divorces takes place. Here, which one plays a vital role, whether feminism or feminism? Feminism is African American uh, uh, concept. So I guess feminist, feminist. I, I mean, feminists do not get divorces, or if the statistics tell so, I do not know whether the person uh, who labels himself as a feminist. Um, a, a woman need not be a feminist, or a man need not be a feminist, or a man can be a feminist. Feminism is nothing but equality. So divorces are not happening to feminists alone; it is happening to everybody. Uh, yes, of course, the rate of divorces has has been increasing over the past uh, period of last period of years, and even now the rate has been increasing. And maybe the technology has a reason to play over that, and especially with TikTok banned in India, I guess we are seeing lots of uh, interesting stories online where we could see a husband, somebody's husband, elopes with other's wife, and lots of such things happen. So of course, even after TikTok is banned, such thing will happen with the use of other social media platforms. So what matters is having your own. authority having your own independence but still making the right use of it making the right use of the platforms uh, having a limit over the platform that is what is essential you, uh, you can you can be on all the platforms that you want to but still you ha you have to make sure that you are making the right use of it you are not supposed to misuse the platform misuse your name sure. or somebody else's name when digital platform provides uh, room for digital harassment what is the role of the government when digital platforms provides a room for digital harassment what is the role of the government i guess that uh, crimes are being reported uh, it's like cyber crimes legal actions are being taken by the government even though that we do not get judgments to uh, soon but still justice is given uh, just like we had for the nirbhaya case re recently government takes action but the only thing is it may take some time but still definitely if women have the guts to uh, to report such incidents to report such actions definitely government will take a look into that so justice will be there justice will prevail if women have if women if women report that uh, yes uh, sometimes a female or male go to file a crime or criminal file they asked for the proof which is not possible for the individual so what could be the solution what i learned is uh, i'm not getting that ma'am yes even i am not getting it so she is telling that if we don't have any proof to provide uh, regarding filing in criminal case what can be the solution to with this uh, digital we can uh, even file, file the so. Yes, ma'am. I can understand that. There are many apps available mm -hmm. online. Like every state gives access to, uh, like the the government gives access to many apps, and uh, we can uh, press that SOS button and make ourselves uh, safe. Yeah, it is that uh, email. Go to file a cyber crime. They ask for the proof, which is not possible for the individual. What could be the solution? There will cyber be proof. File. 
th there will be proof if you if you are just disclosing your details if you are uh, making yourself available to the other person online always you have to have the proof it is our responsibility to have the proof to go on submit in, uh, to the cyber authorities so it is very essential that we have the proof it is better to uh, uh, to take screenshots or something then and there to have really the proof and to submit it to the cyber authorities otherwise we may not have a stand over uh, the cases uh, so there is a chance that we may lose over the cases so it is very essential that we have a proof uh, thank you so much. Uh, we could see that so much of appreciation for our presentation. So we have repeatedly given a detailed answer for all the questions patiently. Uh, thank you. We could see in a very informative presentation and uh, deeply researched the idea regarding your presentation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was, thank really you. It was a pleasure. Session. It was a pleasure joining all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.